Ghost of Tsushima is not a good game. It isn't even a great game. It's a game so near to perfection that it hurts. A large percentage of my time playing the game was spent just standing around looking at the scenery, or admiring the writing and character dialogue. Now this is where a YouTuber critic would normally lay out the general flaws the game has and how they ruined an otherwise perfect game. But I want to get one thing clear right out of the gate. I am not a critic. I will talk about video games, analyze them, break them down, all of that on my channel. But I'm only going to ever talk about games that I truly care about. Only games that I want to share with others. Ghost of Tsushima is 100% a game that I want every gamer to play. So with that being said, yes, there are flaws with Ghost of Tsushima. Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and call it Ghost from now on. But the flaws are so minor, with one exception, that they really do not detract from the overall experience. They are mostly only things that, with the slight tweak, would have enhanced the already phenomenal experience that Sucker Punch Studios have crafted. Because at the end of the day, this is one of the best games I've ever had the joy to play. Released on July 17th, 2020, Ghost of Tsushima is an action-adventure plus stealth game for the PS4 and now PS5. You play as Jin Sakai, only one of two samurai to survive the first battle of the Mongol invasion of Tsushima, and it's your goal to drive back the invaders and sweep them from the island entirely. The game is a third-person perspective, open-world action game that focuses heavily on a rich storyline, even richer characters, even richer -er combat and exploration of the beautiful island on display. It marries open world with story in a way that other games like The Witcher and Horizon Zero Dawn have done, but much more elegantly and with far greater polish. Its vision of feudal Tsushima is what I would call extra realistic. Where games like The Witcher show their worlds with gritty realism that borders on depressing, looking at you, Velen, Tsushima is bright and vibrant in a way that is really only possible in a video game. The cast of characters is relatively small for a game of this size, and each one is given room to breathe and to show off their multidimensionality. The combat is just... wow. Much of my time spent in the game was just finding enemy encampments so that I could hone my combat skills and just fuck some shit up like a samurai. This game is polished to a mirror-like finish, it's truly incredible. In my entire time playing the game, I only ran into one audio bug that is barely worth mentioning. Other than that, the game ran like a dream on the PS5. And finally, the main story, much like some other aspects of the game, is deceptively complex. It starts out as a simple invasion-rebellion storyline, but by the end, it transforms into something much more. And this is the point where I have to warn you about spoilers. I am going to talk about everything in this game, and I do mean everything. I'm breaking this video up into parts, first briefly touching on some of the flaws and or things I would have changed, then moving on to the things I mentioned just a second ago. The performance, the combat, the world building, side quest, visuals, the main story, and then the characters and their own storylines. And then I'm going to touch on the Legends mode. So here are the timestamps of each section so that the video can be viewed in parts if you don't have time for this whole monstrosity. You should also be able to see them on the video timeline and in the description as well. So as you can see, you can stick around for a while, as I will only be spoiling minor things up until about the halfway point. At that time, I'll let you know, and it will be your last chance to get off the video train. Seriously. This game is worth every penny, and I suggest you play it yourselves before watching this video. Or don't. I, I'm not your dad. I can't tell you what to do. I want to get this section out of the way because I'm going to do a ton of gushing about this game, so I think it only fair that I acknowledge some of the game's issues before I do so. Outside of one of these issues, at most they were a minor annoyance, and at best just something that could have been implemented to make the game a little bit more player friendly. 
For people who haven't played the game, some of these might not make sense until later on in the video, but here they are. The flute weather system could have been more impactful. You're given a flute that you can use anytime you're exploring the world and not in combat. It can change the weather by playing a specific song. You start with a sunny day song, but can gain others as you go along. I didn't even bother finding them. As it stands, it's no more than a, oh, I'd rather it be sunny right now. A lock-on mechanic for the combat would have been nice, like you see in Witcher or Dark Souls. It seems there is a soft lock-on system in place, but it's invisible to the player, so sometimes you attack a person you don't want to. Granted, as you become more accustomed to the combat, you can mostly prevent this. The hot springs mechanic, while great world building, is a bit lackluster. Could have done with less springs and more health per dip. I'll talk about this later. This one's not really an issue, just hilarious. NPCs have this really funny tendency when you're following them to open and close the doors before you can walk through. I wish there were more places and opportunities to use the grappling hook. It's a lot of fun, but has limited use cases. It would have been nice if they could have made it something nearer to Spider-Man PS4 web-slinging, though maybe not quite so drastic. I just want to be able to use it everywhere, and other than a couple of forts that are locked until the story progresses, having this different traversal method wouldn't break the game since you can already basically travel anywhere. The haiku minigame is a bit boring. That's it. Again, I'll talk about this later. Sometimes the standoff mechanic is a little wonky. It isn't always clear where you should go to get the prompt to enter the mode, and sometimes it is a very small area that you have to use trial and error to find, all while avoiding enemies' detection. Once again, my favorite phrase, I will touch on standoffs later. More unique bosses would have also been nice to see. Finally, the biggest flaw in the game, in my opinion, is in regard to the story. There are some spoilers here, so skip to the timestamp below if you don't want to hear them. Near the beginning of the game, in a mission with the character Yuna, you learn an assassination technique. You perform one and then the game cuts away to a flashback where your samurai uncle is lecturing you about following the samurai code, which says you must always attack your opponent head on. To attack from the shadows is the coward's way. Throughout the rest of the first two acts of the game, Jin will make comments when you assassinate too many people, calling it cowardly, and occasionally you will get another briefer flashback. For the most part, you can choose whether or not you'll approach encounters stealthily, assassinating Mongols or attacking them head on. I chose the latter whenever possible because it felt like the game had put an exclamation point on this, and I thought there might have been some consequences later on. Uh oh. Oh no. What's that? The dreaded LUDO-NARRATIVE DISSONANCE! For those of you who don't know what LUDO-NARRATIVE DISSONANCE is, which, if you're watching Game Analysis YouTube videos, it's most likely none of you, it's when the gameplay is telling you one thing and the story is telling you the opposite. Like when a game lets you kill hundreds of people in different ways, but then in the cutscenes the character spares someone because they, quote, don't want to become a murderer. In games like that, only what happens in the cutscenes are canon, and the dichotomy can be kind of jarring. So how does that apply here? Well, Ghost allows you to make a choice to assassinate every Mongol on the island if you want. You'll get a stern word from Jin and flashback uncle, but that's about it. Until, at the end of the second act, Jin, his uncle Shimura, and their army are attacking a castle to retake it. There's this big battle that ends in a stalemate on the bridge, which leads to a lull overnight in the fighting. Jin, the character, not you, realizes in a cutscene that his uncle is about to get men killed by trying to storm the entrance head on. He tries to reason with Lord Shimura, saying they should try to infiltrate the castle and take it using more covert means. Poison. He means poison. Poison their drinks. Shimura refuses, so the game forces you to go on a mission to do it anyways. You get no choice in the matter. You have to infiltrate the fort and kill everyone by assassination or poison. This obviously leads to a rift between Jin and Shimura. Now, if this were a movie, that would be good storytelling. But this isn't a movie. This is a game where the player is given choice and agency. You can be the best little samurai, only assassinating in the few times when the game makes it absolutely necessary up until that point, which is what I did. 
And still, the game forces you to make this decision. It's just anticlimactic, and sort of takes away from the experience. Granted, they most likely did this because the missions involved are so major that creating a diverging path would have been ridiculous in terms of development time and money. So I can understand why they didn't do it, but then they shouldn't have placed such emphasis on making it feel like it was your choice to assassinate or not up until that point. <sighs> so yeah, those are my gripes. Only one medium one and a few extremely tiny ones. Now let's get on to the good stuff because there is a whole hell of a lot of that. Right off the bat, I want to say that if you have a PS5, are planning to get one soon, or were thinking about getting one, wait to play this game until you get it. Don't get me wrong, it runs admirably on the PS4. With the level of detail on display, the fact that the 8-year-old machine can deliver a solid 30 frames per second is actually amazing. The frame timings are great too. I'd put them on par with the Final Fantasy VII remake, and much better than, like, say, Bloodborne. The PS4 Pro supposedly offers an even more stable 30 frames per second, which I don't know, I, I don't have one to confirm. But the point is, the PS5 runs natively at 4K 60 frames per second, and it's an absolutely solid 60 frames, as if it was how the game was meant to be played. And that's not even mentioning the drastically improved load times. Now, fast traveling between any two points takes around 4 to 5 seconds. I never noticed any dropped frames at any point in the game, and between the stable frame rate and perfect frame timings, the game is just buttery smooth. See, I actually bought the game at release, but because I have been spoiled by PC gaming, doing anything at 30 frames per second has just become jarring to me. I know, I know, I sound like an asshole, but what can I say? We are what we eat. So, I only picked back up in the game when I finally got my PS5, and boy, am I glad I did. I mentioned in the intro that I experienced a single bug in my 50 plus hours with the game. It was an audio bug where the woman talking to me sounded as though she was in another room for a while. I could still hear her, but it was off. I wouldn't even mention it except to highlight that it was the only time I ever saw any kind of flaw with this game's performance. In the age of cyberpunks, fallouts, and assassin's creeds, it almost seems like it's a given that large open world games will come riddled with bugs, so to see the same game type with this level of polish is truly astounding. Granted, I experienced this game about 7 months after its release, so I don't know how it was exactly at its release, but whether or not that polish was there at that time, the fact that it runs this smoothly now speaks volumes by itself. The combat in this game, just like the story, is deceptively complex. At first, you're given a light attack and a heavy attack, and that's it. There's some combos that you can do, but virtually all of them are just pressing the light attack button twice or three times in a row, ditto for the heavy. So how could a system this simple be interesting at all? Well, that's a good question that isn't answered right away in the game. And it's a big part of why I didn't give the game a chance at first, along with my snobbery. You see, where most games would either give you a barrage of different combos like Spider-Man, or just give you a ton of different weapons and things to use like Breath of the Wild, Ghost finds a third option, Stances. And it does some other things that those two games do as well, but we'll get to that in a bit. During your playtime, you'll encounter four different base types of melee enemies. Sword guys, shield guys, spear guys, and big boys. There are ranged enemies and subtypes within the melee categories as well as harder variants, but I digress. Jin has a counter for each of these four types of enemies in the form of stances. For sword guys, there's stone stance. For shield guys, there's water stance. For spearmen, there's wind stance. And for the big boy brutes, there's moon stance. You just show them your ass. Not really. I'm sorry, I had to. So what are stances? At the most basic level, they change the way your character holds his katana, and more importantly, the form your light and heavy attacks take. For example, in stone stance, your heavy attacks are stabbing thrusts to break through the enemy's sword deflections, whereas in water stance, they are rapid upward and downward strikes to knock away the enemy's shield. 
each of the enemy types have different styles and aggression dynamics. The shield men and sword guys are mostly the ones that will sit back in large confrontations, but will attack your back from time to time. The spearmen are by far the most aggressive, and since the wind stance is the third one that you get in the game after many hours of play, it's tough to combat at first. Even then, most of their attacks will be unblockable until you level up your skill tree. The key for this all to work is that the game almost never challenges Jin with one enemy, and each enemy can block your attacks until you break their blocks with a heavy attack, causing them to stagger. This is not a one-on-one -on -one combat system, and the heavy attacks using the wrong stance for a certain enemy type will do less stagger damage. You're almost always surrounded by multiple enemies of multiple different classes, so to use the combat system effectively, you must learn to dynamically switch between stances in the middle of the battle. This is what makes the combat system interesting. Because of these two mechanics, hot swapping stances and player versus mob combat, every fight feels hectic and leaves you on the edge of your seat. Once you spend some time in the game, you'll learn that there is a particular flow to combat, not dissimilar to God of War. Actually, at the risk of sounding cliché, it's kind of like if God of War and Sekiro had a baby. Every enemy will have three main types of attacks, normal, blue, and red. Normal and blue attacks can be parried while red cannot. Some red attacks become blue as you unlock different skills in your skill tree, which opens up more possibilities in combat. Outside of that, red attacks must be dodged, or tanked, I guess, if you enjoy taking damage. Other than the basic light and heavy attacks that you're given, at the beginning you first learn to parry basic attacks and a quick step dodge. But eventually, you'll be able to parry all sword attacks as well as spear attacks too, and gain bonuses for doing so. Same thing goes for dodging. As you level up the tree, you gain, among other things, a dodge roll, a shoulder charge, and a perfect dodge which allows you to make a brutal counterattack. What about healing? Well, Ghost deals with healing in a different way than most games as well. Rather than going in the route of consumables as in The Witcher, where you can hold a near infinite amount, it's closer to Dark Souls and the Estus Flask. In Ghosts, you are given resolve charges, which show up as golden circles above your health bar. You begin with three and can gain more as you go on throughout your journey. But unlike Dark Souls, you can regain resolve charges through combat, though they are not automatically replenished when you die either. You start out gaining back a small amount of resolve for performing things like parries at the correct times. However, as you level up your skill trees, there are other means to gain it back as well, such as perfect dodges, standoffs, and even just taking damage. Ah yes, the standoff. Probably the single most discussed elements of ghosts outside of maybe the guiding wind. This is a unique combat mechanic that is only available when you first happen upon a group of enemies, whether it be a patrol, or a Mongol occupied town. You can only enter this mode if you meet your enemies head on, so no sneaking around picking off enemies. When you get near to them, the game will give you a prompt to enter standoff mode, and both you and one enemy will meet, readying your weapons for a one on one duel. While there is a lot of visual flair to the standoff, the actual mechanics are really simple. You just hold down triangle until the enemy lunges forward, then release the button, and Jin will insta-kill them in one slow-mo swipe. The timing is fairly lenient, however sometimes the enemy will feint an attack to get you to release early. Any missed timings will result in your health nearly going to zero, and you must immediately use resolve to heal up. And you cannot exit a standoff early. Standoffs aren't just for show though. Successfully pulling one off will both kill an enemy and refill three to four resolve charges, which is extremely helpful when you are about to take on Mongol strongholds. You can also get armor or skills that increase the number of enemies that charge you in a standoff, sequentially, not all at once, which when successfully executed will give you even more resolve charges. So I really enjoyed both the resolve and standoff mechanics. They are both unique ways to solve the problem of how to provide the player with enough healing so that they're never having to farm for consumables, nor are you ever effectively unkillable with an infinite supply of healing. These two mechanics reward fighting enemies head on, acting like a good samurai boy and engaging in the combat system to its fullest. However, that's not where combat ends. That's just the base upon which everything else builds. You see, there are multiple different skill trees that you can level up as you play the game. 
Actually, I failed to mention that the stances are one of these tree systems. You start the game only with stone stance, and to get more, you either have to fight or quote-unquote observe Mongol leaders. In the first few hours, you'll meet Sensei Ishikawa, who teaches you the way of the bow. With this, you gain ranged options. Later, you meet Yuna, who teaches you stealth assassination techniques. Each of these comes with their own basic trees as well, with perks to gain. And in the case of assassination or ghost techniques, you will gain other tools to use, including kunai, bombs, sticky bombs, smoke bombs, decoy bells, firecrackers, and black powder bombs. Your ranged options include a half bow, a long bow, which is more powerful and has a slower draw time, fire arrows, explosive arrows, and much later in the game, you'll get a blowgun with poison darts and hallucinogenic darts to make enemies attack their allies. Now you may be able to see why I say the game takes a page from Spider-Man. You have tons of options in combat, and you can approach encounters in completely different ways. Many of these can be used either outright to kill enemies, or as an alternative way to cause stagger damage, or in a pinch to ward off just a few of the mob that's rushing you. Typically, a fight with a group of enemies will go something like this. You throw a ghost weapon to stagger a group, single out an enemy to fight first, switch to their stance type, heavy attack to stagger, light attack to combo to finish them off, and then move on to the next enemy. Of course, this is just like the most basic form that combat can take, and the game offers a great amount of flexibility. Like, you could just take them all out with a bow, or just a few in the middle of combat by using the concentration time slow. Or you could jump on a roof, throw a firecracker to draw a group of enemies, and then throw a bomb to kill the bulk of them, and jump down and mop up the rest. These are just a few of the things you could do, and hopefully it illustrates how the wide variety of tools you're given can result in an even deeper combat system. Finally, there's a gear-based component to combat as well. While you will always have the same sword and bow that you start with, you can upgrade each of these in town to cause more damage. In the same way, you can upgrade basically every other tool or piece of armor that you obtain throughout the game to make them all more effective. You will also find charms in your journey, which slot into your sword and give you different types of perks ranging from bonus health to increased damage to a faster recharge of the slowdown effect when aiming your bow, and so many more. In addition to all that, there are multiple sets of armor that each offer their own unique perks. Every piece of equipment you have can be upgraded, and many of them can be customized in a cosmetic sense as well. All told, it offers a rich combat system that takes the best parts from many different types and meshes them together. These gear and ability progression systems are also extended through mythic quests. These are seven special quests that have you find either a special ability or a set of mythical armor. There are three sets of armor, the Gosaku, Kensai, and Tadayori, and none of these are outright more powerful than the other types of armor throughout the game, but they do have some unique properties. Gosaku is a more melee-type armor that gives a boost to health, but also an increase to stagger damage. It makes it easier to break through enemies' defenses. Tadayori is built around making you a more powerful bowman, reducing draw time and making the concentration time slow effect last longer, and charge time is quicker. The Kinsei armor is built around the ghost weapon mechanics, making your ghost weapons more powerful and making the enemies affected by them weaker to sword damage. The mythic abilities range in power, but are all highly effective in their own way. First is the Heavenly Strike. It's the most basic, a simple yet unblockable slash that requires a single charge of resolve to use. The next is Uchitsune's Longbow and Explosive Arrows. So, okay, I guess this one isn't so much an ability as it is an extra weapon, but it's still really effective. The Longbow has less arc and is much more effective at a longer range, with the trade-off being a longer draw time. It also comes with explosive arrows, which are particularly powerful for dispersing groups of enemies. Basically, this is the same explosion as a ghost bomb. The Undying Flame is an ability that lets you set your sword on fire. This is fun to use, but, but probably in last place in terms of pure effectiveness. It can kill enemies faster than with a normal sword strike, and can sort of stagger them for a few moments, but isn't a true stagger, and both the sword flame itself and the enemies set on fire do not last for long. The most powerful of the gained abilities is the Dance of Wrath. 
Activated with the L1-R1 combo and requiring three resolve charges, this is a powerful charge attack that hits three times. It attacks an enemy until they are dead, and then moves on to the next closest enemy. Usually they'll drop in one hit, so it can hit up to three enemies around you, though not for more powerful foes. Either way, it's a great oh shit ability to have in your bag if you get surrounded and are out of ghost bombs or kunai. I almost wrote that this was the super or ultimate of the game, but then I remembered the ghost mode. Halfway through the main story, in what is easily the best mission in the entire game, the Siege of Yarikawa, you will gain a new ability called Ghost Mode. This is the super or ultimate for this game. It's basically the Super Mario Star ability. For a short period, the screen goes black and white, and Jin is completely invincible as enemies will cower away in fear and fall within one strike. However, you don't get this ability for free. To activate it, you will first have to defeat a certain number of enemies without taking any damage. That number requirement can be lowered with armor and charms. The ability seems to last for three kills, but personally I didn't use it much. See, while I did occasionally use things like Dance of Wrath to get out of sticky situations, both it and especially Ghost Mode felt almost like cheating to me. I really can't express how much I enjoy the combat system in the game, and even the Heavenly Strike, while unblockable, isn't an instant kill. Having a god mode at my fingertips, even with the kill requirements, just kind of felt cheap. Why would I rob myself of the cool combat moments I could have? All skill is taken away from the player in these modes, which is sort of counter to the design philosophy of the rest of Ghost's combat. Personally, I would have rather seen more combos like Heavenly Strike, i.e. situational moves that were flashy and had utility, while not an instant kill god mode. Oh no. I can't end the combat section on a bad note. Not when that was one of my favorite aspects of the game. Seriously, if you haven't played this game, go experience it for yourself. Give it a couple hours to get used to the controls and gain the second stance to switch between. It's well worth your time and effort. Plus, the boss fights, yeah, I didn't talk about them yet. There are a bunch throughout the game, with varied opponents. Most are just beefed up versions of normal opponents, however their movesets are completely different from the average grunt. These fights, on hard mode at least, can be really difficult. More than a few times I got stuck on a boss for 10 to 15 tries even. Just like in a Soulsborne game, the bosses have well telegraphed attacks that, when learned, can be used to effectively combat them. And though there is a gear based part to combat, like I mentioned, the bosses always feel like if you just learn their attacks well enough, you can beat them with whatever gear and gear level you're at. This is how fights, boss fights especially, should be. The gear-based progression should feel like an enhancement to combat, rather than a requirement. One thing to note is that since they are beefed up versions of normal enemies, you would expect the correct stance for the enemy type to be more effective, but this didn't always feel like it was the case. For example, I didn't notice any difference between stances when fighting a sword wielder, but with a sword and shield guy, the heavy water stance combo was effective at staggering them. So I can't really say for sure. I would still have liked to see more unique bosses, however the combat system and quality of boss fights on display were enough to satisfy my need for that side of combat. Okay, now I can move on. Visuals and world building are sort of intertwined, so this section and the next are also going to be intertwined, but I'm going to do my best to keep them separate as possible. Ghost is beautiful in a way that no other realistic open world game I've played has ever been. Most games of this type, like The Witcher or Red Dead Redemption 2, fall into the trap of appearing too realistic and coming off as drab and at times honestly depressing. I called out The Witcher 3 for this in my intro, which I still stand by. However, that game did get better in the Toussaint area. So for reference, all of Ghosts is as good or better than Toussaint, even with its varying area types. While other games have struck this balance well, like Horizon Zero Dawn or in a totally different way, Cyberpunk 2077, in my opinion, Ghost of Tsushima has a more rich, gorgeous world than any of them. From its lush golden forests with a yellow layer of leaves on the ground that shift as you walk through them, to huge fields of long pampas grass flowing in the wind, 
to the cold north with white trees and snow-covered ground offset by bright crimson bushes, to the ocean fronts with actual waves coming into the beaches, erupting in a cloud of spray when they hit a lone rock. All of that is just better than realism. It is extra realistic. This is clearly what Sucker Punch was going for. They knew exactly what they had in Ghost and wanted to show it off because outside of the environment itself, they took some pretty drastic steps to accentuate immersion in their world. First and foremost is the game's commitment to never distract from the beauty they created. Where other open world games will crowd the edges of the screen with health bars, ability bars, a compass, mini maps, and tons of other types of information, Ghost says no thanks. Oftentimes, while exploring this beauty of a map, there is none of that at all. Absolutely nothing separates you from the world in those stretches. In fact, the only time there is any sort of HUD is in combat when a small health bar and resolve charges appear on the bottom of the screen, or when you swipe the touchpad to show the guiding wind and objective information appears at the top. But both of those are only temporary, and as soon as you go back to exploring, they both disappear from the screen. Right, the guiding wind. This is one of the most ingenious parts of the game. Other open world games need to take notes from Sucker Punch's creativity. Since there is no mini-map or compass, the game had to find a different way to show the player where to go in such a large open world. Enter Guiding Wind. When you swipe up on the touchpad, the wind will pick up around you showing dust plumes and white gust lines all moving in the direction you need to go. But even if you don't do the swipe gesture, the wind is always moving in the right direction, just slower and less noticeable. This way, no matter where you are or what you're doing, you will always know where to go without needing a minimap. Genius. Of course, there is still a normal game map, but it's in the start screen, which is where you can select mission objectives or waypoints that serve as targets for the guiding wind. I could go on and on about the graphical fidelity, the character models and textures and the like, but I'm not really an expert on the subject. The best I could say, and I will say, is that they are all fantastic, and I would just end up gushing about it if I talked any more. So let's move on. Great visuals are like a lens. A lens can be completely immaculate, completely in focus, and have clarity that would make a diamond blush. But if it's focused on a pile of dog shit, then that really nice lens isn't going to mean a whole lot. Luckily, the actual world of ghosts isn't a pile of dog shit. It's, uh, you know, whatever the opposite of that is, actually. So let's look at it from a top-down order. The island of Tsushima is where the entire game takes place, outside of a couple of missions that occur on a ship off the coast. The island is divided up into three regions, Izuhara in the south, which is where you start, Toyotama in the middle, which is where you go next, and Kamiyagata, which is where the game ends. Each region has its own defining theme. The starting region, Izuhara, is, in my opinion, the most beautiful of the three. This could be viewed in a couple of ways. One is that the game starts out on its best foot. On the other hand, it means that the areas only get less beautiful as you go on. And while this is somewhat true, it vastly oversimplifies things. So we'll get to this later. This starting area is lush with golden trees, thick forests and grasslands, and white cliff faces cut through by gorgeous flowing rivers, some of the best water physics and visuals outside of Red Dead 2. By far the prettiest place in the game is inside the Golden Forest, at the truly originally named Golden Temple. I don't really even have words for how mesmerized I was by the first time I visited. The way it is almost a natural extension of the forest around it, nestled in like it has always been there, was just amazing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. After the first couple story missions, you are immediately set loose on your horse in Izuhara, with basically no information other than three objective markers on your map for the first three story missions, which you can complete in whichever order you choose. Even the map is just a haze, completely grayed out with a fog other than those three markers. So you are, in a sense, completely free in whatever you do next, and discovering everything totally on your own. This isn't something that really changes with a single mission. You don't just suddenly have all the icons on your map, or town names and locations, or anything like that. 
To get this information, you have to find a Mongol stronghold, usually in the form of an occupied town or fort. Free it from their control and watch the citizens come back, and then it and the near vicinity are cleared of the fog on your map, and any points of interest that are in the radius are revealed as question marks. These points of interest can range from a number of different things. But one thing is for sure, each one of them will give you some sort of gear boost, stat boost, or cosmetic items. None of them feel pointless or like a waste of time, which makes exploring that much more fun and rewarding. Granted, this is how games like this are usually supposed to be, but not many get that sense of exploration just right. Many are just the exact same enemy encampments copy and pasted all over the map, with boring rewards that don't really seem worth it. So what do these points of interest offer? Well, let's get to it. Hot springs allow you to take a nice soak to increase your maximum health. Bamboo stands let you practice your sword combo skills to increase your maximum resolve or healing charges. Shrines are platforming challenges that'll give you powerful charms at the end, which you can equip to gain a ton of different combat and exploration bonuses. Fox dens house boxes, which you can follow to find shrines that increase the number of slots for you to equip said charms. There are even multiple different types of cosmetic vanity gear locations, most of which are just simple pickups with nothing else attached. Also, there's the haiku locations, where you play a boring haiku minigame to get equally boring headbands. For many of these, there's a skill that allows you to use the guiding wind to find them, even if you don't have the location question marks unlocked on your map. You simply go to the map and select, for example, Healing Hot Springs, and the guiding wind will take you to the nearest one to your location. Of the different points of interest, only some are really worth a closer look for the purposes of this video. For example, there isn't much to the hot springs, which increase your health. Jin gets naked, then dips his chiseled butt in the water and reflects on one thing or another, and then boom, health increased. Like I said in my flaws section, I do wish that these offered more of a boost with fewer locations, but that's about all the commentary I can offer on them. It's a decent mechanic that uses the world in a unique way to increase your character's stats, but others have more to them. The shrines are platforming quote-unquote puzzles. None of them are particularly hard. There is usually only one path to follow, though it might take a second to realize what or where that path is. This gives me an excuse to talk about the climbing mechanics in this game. While it does contain the same boring climbing you find in Uncharted or God of War, the kind where you just press up the whole time, that is only one piece. Ghost uses actual platforms for you to actually jump on, which are interspersed throughout the entire shrine runs. Additionally, during Act 1, Jin gets a grappling hook, which is fucking awesome. Take notes, devs. All games should have grappling hooks that work basically fucking everywhere. Okay, maybe that's a bit too much hyperbole, but I really like using them. It's 90% of the reason Spider-Man is so much fun. His web is basically a grappling hook. Change my mind. But I digress. Each of these shrine runs are split up between the three jumping, climbing, and grappling mechanics, and they are just interesting enough to be a welcome change of pace. And that isn't even taking into consideration the rewards at the end. The shrines will give you powerful charms as opposed to the normal ones you get during normal side quests. Because of that, and because each shrine is a different puzzle entirely, they can be a really fun distraction that only take a few minutes to complete. On the other side of the spectrum, the haiku minigames are just extremely boring. I mentioned this in the things that I didn't like, but I figure I should expound upon what I meant. Basically, you will find spots on the island where your character sits in meditation. You are given control of the game camera over a specific piece of scenery, almost like you're watching a video. There will be two or three different spots in the scenery with a button prompt and a line of haiku attached. You press the button to choose the line, then move on to a new scene and a new button prompt, then again to a third one. All in all, you press three buttons and Jin reads the resulting haiku. See what I mean? It's pretty lame, to be honest. I get that the act of writing haikus is true to the culture and history of samurai, and I applaud Sucker Punch for including details like these in the game, but it surely could have been made more interesting. Just so I'm not complaining without offering solutions, for example, there could have been some sort of grading system for your haikus. As of now, there's no wrong answers. No matter what lines you pick, Jin reads the resulting poem, and you're rewarded with a cosmetic headband. 
There is already a theme for each haiku, so I could imagine a system where there are more choices with certain combinations being a better representation of the given theme. Then there could have been different tiers of rewards for how good your choice was. But when all is said and done, these are completely optional, don't affect your character's power, and are at least very short if you do decide to do them. There is a lot to the island outside of these points of interest, too. On your journey, you will run across patrols of Mongols and Japanese bandits, which you can fight. These patrols will either have a cart full of goodies for you to loot, or a hostage which you can release. In the case of the latter, the hostage will tell you of a problem that needs solving. This will place a marker on your map that leads to a side quest. In fact, this is how most side quests are found, other than the few that you might find in town while talking to people. This is a much better system, in my opinion, than the usual exclamation mark that is just there on the map to start with. That way seems much more gamey, and I'm always interested in creative ways game developers find to always keep the player immersed in the game world. This is one of those ways. It feels more natural, like you're actually on the island and taking care of problems as you hear about them. One thing I didn't know about until the game was nearly over were the golden birds. Again, while traveling the island, you will sometimes see a yellow gold bird swoop down and fly in front of you. Follow it. It will lead you to some nearby point of interest. It can be one that's already a question mark on your map, or one that's still shrouded in fog. Again, this is a great way of allowing the world to speak for itself, as it were, letting the player stay immersed in the game and looking at the map less while still communicating important information. By the time you get to the second area, Toyotama, you will already have learned much of the stuff I just spoke about. You'll be an old hat at exploring, so to speak. This region is sort of swamp themed, and at first I was pretty disappointed in this. The area that you will most likely enter Toyotama through is reminiscent of Velen from The Witcher 3. Wet, muddy, dull, and depressing. But don't let that fool you. That's just the small entrance to the area. As you explore, you'll find that this swamp is actually very beautiful. From the willow trees, or are those willows? Whatever they are, to the bright blue flowers that stick out in the marsh puddles, it becomes much prettier than Velen could ever hope to be. And then, then you get to the red flower marsh, and this one area is probably the prettiest place in the entire game, a sentence which I will probably say at least three times in this video. This area alone will make you want to stop and look around for a bit, maybe even toy with the game's impressive photo mode. Just a sea of red flowers as far as the eye can see, all gently blowing in the wind. Truly majestic. The final area you visit is Kamiagata, the snowy area, which you reach in Act 3. It's by far the shortest part of the game, but there is still a lot to do here nonetheless. It's also absolutely gorgeous. Go figure. This area is under a perpetual snowfall and snow covering basically every inch of the ground. There isn't the same amount of impressive deep snow tessellation technology that you see in Horizon Zero Dawn or Monster Hunter World Iceborne, but the rest of the environment makes up for it. The white trees blend in with the constant blowing snow, and it's all contrasted by the brilliant crimson bushes. It's really striking the first time you ride through. Same goes for the cedar forest you go through and route to the cedar temple. The cedar trees are huge and majestic and really speak of a forest that is very old. I mean, goddamn, the art designers at Sucker Punch must have made some Faustian bargain to create shit this pretty. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on the normal side quests that you complete through the game. There are too many and I am no Joseph Anderson. This video is already long enough. However, I will say that basically none of them are offensive fetch quests or long trailing missions. In fact, there are only a handful of very short moments in the game where you have to follow someone at anything less than full speed. This is one of the great quality of life changes this game makes over other open worlds. <clears throat> Assassin's Creed. <clears throat> Subtle. In those games, you have to follow people at awkward speeds, slower than sprinting, but faster than walking. And that shit is super annoying. But 90% of the time in this game, when you're walking or riding alongside a person, they will adjust their speed according to your own. What was I talking about? Why am I asking? I'm reading from a script. This is all planned. The universe is an illusion. Nothing is real.
Anyways, the side quests never really reach Witcher 3 levels of humor or self-awareness, which is okay since this game takes itself much more seriously. But that quality is what I think sets apart the Witcher side quests and why people usually gush over that game. There are quite a few side quests in Ghosts that try to do too much with a twist in the end that end up being too predictable. But as I said, nothing offensive. And despite all that, every side quest in Ghost has some sort of interesting story to it, even if it's just a couple minutes long. I will, however, go into detail on the Mythic Tales. I touched on the gear and abilities you get from these tales in the combat section, but the quests themselves are worth discussing. Each one begins with Jin hearing from a random citizen about a musician telling stories and singing songs about some legend or another. As it turns out, it's always the same musician for these tales, Yamato. When you find him, he tells you the ancient story as well, and you use the clues to find the location of the abilities or armors. On one of the quests, he tells you of a demon that haunted Tsushima in ancient times, and the bow that the hero Uchitsune used to pierce the demon's heart. Yamato doesn't know much, but he says to look for blue flowers. You find them, a large patch of them in fact, and they form a sort of trail that leads to a shrine to Uchitsune, and there you find a clue to the location of the bow. Side note, a couple other mythic tales use this mechanic of looking for a certain colored flower. I'm generally okay with this recycling, if not totally in love with the idea. Regardless, it all keeps you within the world, which is the more important factor in my opinion. The clue is a painting of a small island with the same blue flowers that you just found. You take the painting and set off to the island, without any knowledge other than the general region where the island could be. The island has another shrine with another painting, this time of a mountain, and so once you find it, you set off again. One notable thing here is that you keep the painting with you, and you're able to compare it to the landscape with a swipe of the gesture pad. This is a completely unique mechanic, and it's never repeated or used again in the game. It's not a huge deal, but shows how much effort the devs put into even the small details. Anyways, finally at the mountain, you stumble on the actual resting place of Uchitsune's bow, and you're confronted by a demon, a Tengu, in a duel. Or, well, it definitely appears to be a demon. It's implied that it's the same Tengu that Uchitsune fought. This is probably the closest the game ever comes to showing the player something truly supernatural. It flirts with the concept at times, but often ends it like an episode of Scooby-Doo, with Jin figuring out that the ghost was just old man hooch playing on the people's superstitions. This fight is giving you just a taste of the supernatural, and begs the question of whether or not it's all real, as a thick swarm of locusts surrounds the dueling grounds, somewhat hampering your vision of the Tengu. Regardless of the implications, the fight itself is amazing. The demon has insane speed and can seemingly attack from nowhere, especially with the locusts obscuring things. And it is finalized with getting an awesome piece of gear that now has a history you just learned through gameplay. These are my favorite types of quests. Ones that not only have good gameplay and good story elements, but ones that blend the two into each other, making you experience the story through gameplay and letting you use the story to figure out the gameplay. This is, in my opinion, what gaming should look like. And it's just one of the many building blocks which make the island of Tsushima that Sucker Punch has created truly special. The mission I just described is only one of the seven available mythic tales, and since I've already described one in detail and talked about the rewards of the others, I'll leave the rest to you guys because I believe that these are some of the best missions in the game and are really worth experiencing yourselves, especially the one on the snowy mountain do not skip that one. Fucking crazy. Just a couple other things that I really don't have any other space for, so I'm going to stick it into world building because that's the catch-all. First off, this game offers a ton of little quality of life enhancements, some of which I might have mentioned before. But one I know I haven't mentioned is that you can pick up items from your horse. This includes dropped enemy loot, plants, and just other normal items around the world. You can even do it at a full gallop. Compare that to The Witcher 3, which forces you to get off your horse entirely and then go pick it up. Like The Witcher 3, the horse in this game can be summoned from anywhere. One thing I really didn't like about Breath of the Wild 
was that it tried to be a little too realistic, that your horse could only be called within a certain radius around it. After that, you had to summon it from a stable or something like that. In this game, they break with realism a little bit to make it easier on the player. And so no matter where you are, you can call your horse. And if it's more than like 20 feet away, then it just spawns directly behind you. So you don't really break the immersion by seeing it pop in, but you also don't have to wait. And finally, New Game Plus in this offers a ton of new cosmetic options and charms. You can get all these different outfits from NPCs in the game like Ryuso and Ishikawa. You can get tons of new hats and then charms which offer either hindrances or helpful perks. One of which will cause lightning to strike an enemy whenever you perform a heavenly strike, or at least it has a chance to. Another one will basically make your game super hard mode where any attacks will kill you, or there's just one that makes things more bloody. Either way, all the missions in New Game Plus that would have awarded you with skills and abilities that you already have offer you this new currency that you can spend at a new vendor, which gives you access to all these cosmetics and charms and stuff. It's pretty cool and it's a good way to incentivize playing New Game Plus if there weren't already enough incentive as it was. This is when the truly major spoilers begin, so if you plan on playing this game and are sensitive to that sort of thing, this is really, honest to god, your last opportunity to turn off the video and experience it for yourself. Some of the stuff in this section and the next I will spoil the endings of, and on some I won't. There isn't much rhyme or reason to it, only that, well, some things struck such a chord with me that I wanted to talk about them and others didn't. Okay? We good? Okay, cool. So to recap, the game begins with the Mongols invading Tsushima at Kaneda Beach. They totally wipe out the samurai of Tsushima, save for Jin, his uncle Shimura, and a couple others that weren't actually at the battle. After taking a bunch of arrows to the back, Jin wakes up in a small village in the midst of being ransacked by the Mongols. Here he meets Yuna, who just nursed him back to health. It's a bit unclear how much time has passed, but enough for Jin to be basically healed. The two sneak out of town, nabbing up Jin's sword and armor, and a couple horses on the way. The horse bit is very pointed. You pick between one of three differently colored horses and then give it a name. The game even says that the horse will remain with you throughout your entire journey. So it sure would be a shame if that were some tragic foreshadowing, huh, sucker punch? Now I know where you get your name. Assholes. Anyway, Jin and Yuna immediately head off to Castle Kaneda, where the Khan is holding Lord Shimura. They manage to infiltrate the castle, and Jin makes it to the bridge connecting to the main keep. He calls out to the Khan, who meets him on the bridge. A fight ensues, where Jin gets his ass absolutely handed to him, and falls about a hundred feet from the bridge to the ocean below. This dude has some seriously thick plot armor. Once again, you wake up, this time on a beach, your horse is there, and you still have your sword and armor. So you set off, with no clear direction. Here is where the world opens up to you. You meet up with Yuna to discuss how best to get back into Castle Kaneda, and it's decided that you need to find the surviving samurai of Tsushima to aid you in storming the castle, if there's to be any chance of success. Yuna agrees to help, but only if you help her find and rescue her brother, Taka, first, and then help them get off the island. It seems Taka has been taken by the Mongols. So you set off meeting Sensei Ishikawa, the bowmaster, Masako, the badass female samurai, Ryuzo, a mercenary straw hat ronin, and Yuna and Taka, taking on the beginnings of their storylines. Since I will be speaking about these specific character storylines in the next section, I won't go into detail here. Except that Yuna's storylines ends at Komatsu Forge, where you take Taka to craft the tool to scale the walls of Castle Kaneda. The Mongols have caught word of people in Komatsu, and so you must hold off attack on the town as Taka crafts the tool. It's a grappling hook, and it's freaking awesome as I've already said. Once done, you all meet outside Castle Kaneda. It's decided that Jin will scale the castle walls with his new handy dandy grappling hook, while the others will take the castle from the front, distracting the Mongols within. When you get inside, however, you find that conniving, backstabbing Ryuso has sided with the Khan in a decently earned twist. More on this in the next section. And I'm sorry, I know that's like my favorite phrase, but trust me. 
After Jin deals with that asshole, he sneaks into the keep and rescues Lord Shimura, and the two drive the remaining Mongols from the castle. Unfortunately, it seems that the Khan had left just before you attacked, moving his army up to Castle Shimura to the north. Lord Shimura immediately takes charge and leads an attack to retake a fort in Toyotama. Once this battle is over, you are told of a warrior monk that your men rescued from the Mongols. This is a new main character named Norio, who has his own storyline. Lord Shimura decides that he needs an army to retake his castle, as the bulk of the Mongol army is stationed there now. Shimura has also decided that he will help Yuna escape the island, but only if she helps him retake his castle. Without much of a choice, Yuna offers to help by recruiting the people of Yarikawa, as that is where she grew up. It's also decided that Jin must go to his family home and get his father's armor, and a message must be sent to the Shogun on the mainland to hopefully gain more samurai to retake Tsushima. So these are the three main objectives in Toyotama for Act 2. First, Yarikawa. This is a city that at one time rebelled against and were put down by Lord Shimura and Clan Sakai which is Jin's family. So they absolutely hate both Jin and Lord Shimura. When you get to Yarikawa, it is under siege on all sides by Mongols. What follows is absolutely the best quest slash mission in any game I have ever played, hands down. No hyperbole. First, you sneak through the Mongol lines and then into the city through a secret passage behind a waterfall. It really wouldn't be a historical epic without at least one of these, right? Anyways, there you find out that the people of Yarikawa still hate Jen's family, which is a surprise to nobody, and none of them will join the cause. But you also find out that the famed Yarikawan archers went out on their own to fight the Mongols and haven't been heard from since, so Jin and Yuna decide to go save them if possible and bring them back to win the town over. As for right now, the town is basically defenseless outside of their walls. You find the archers out in the wilderness, stalking Mongol patrols, and then take them back to the city to a slightly warmer reception this time. A cutscene ensues where Jin and Yuna drink and talk through the night in the city keep, waiting for the inevitable Mongol attack. This next part is where it gets really good. Like, really good. Jin wakes up to find the Mongols attacking. He rushes down the walls to see this. After successfully repelling the Mongols at multiple gates to the city, trebuchets begin attacking. So you split with Yuna and go take out the trebis. Upon taking out the last one, you notice that the town is being overrun, so you rush back. When you enter the town, you see people fleeing towards the keep, with the Mongols right on their heels. You follow them, attacking Mongols that get in your way, and when you finally reach the keep, you see the Mongol general surrounded by his men. Thus begins a boss fight. And that boss fight ends like this. Invaders, look at your general. Run, run. That is a new skill that absolutely terrifies any Mongol nearby, and one-shots them as well. It's the ghost mode that I talked about in the combat section, that I didn't really like. However, this introduction is fucking badass. You then lead a charge of Yarikawans out of the keep and back down to the gates, forcing the Mongols to retreat out of the city. And just like that, the day is won. Having convinced the people of Yarikawa to defend their hometown, Jin and Yuna now convince them of doing the same for all of Tsushima, and to join Lord Shimura's cause in the name of the Ghost, or Jin. I guess this is as good of a time as any to mention that Yuna created a folktale around Jin, calling him the Ghost, and making people believe that he is almost a supernatural being, making him into an icon or a symbol for the people to believe in. This is where the name of the game comes from. So next, Jin goes to visit the Sakai clan home and drives off bandits from Omi village nearby, as well as going through the Yuriko quest line, which, again, I will speak about in the next section. Sorry about repeating that so much. The Sakai clan armor is really cool, but the story part outside of Yuriko's quest line isn't really much to speak about. Other than that Jin didn't think he deserved his father's armor since he was there when bandits killed him and did nothing to help when his father cried out to him. However, Yuriko and Lord Shimura have helped to convince him that his deeds in helping to save Tsushima have made him worthy to wear it. 
Finally, we get to the mission to send a message to the Shogun on the mainland. This takes you to a seedy town hidden in the swamp called Umugi Cove. It's run by a woman who is sort of like a mob boss. The town is basically a smuggler's haven, and it's patrolled by Straw Hat Ronin. Though apparently not the same ones under Ryuso because they don't attack you. Anyways, there's a guy there that Lord Shimura knew from his past that can get a message out by boat. Only problem is, there is a Mongol blockade that is preventing any ships from leaving. So you have to get Lord Shimura to help you attack a fort to take out the blockade. This mission is pretty cool because it's one of the first times you get to go up directly against a Huacha, which is basically a fire arrow gatling gun that is just as badass as the name sounds. As you rush the fort, the arrows rain down on you, marked by red circles on the ground that you can dodge. You finally take out the men manning the Huacha and take control of it yourself. There is a brief disagreement and tension between Jin and Shimura about the honor of using such a device, but Shimura eventually concedes. And a good thing too, because this part is really cool. This thing is basically a turret, and you use it to take out all the ships in the bay blocking the path of the messenger. Sort of reminiscent to the combat from Assassin's Creed 4, you know, the pirate one. You will get to use a Huacha later on, but using it here to take out ships is another example of the game using bespoke mission mechanics a single time. It's a really effective trick in game design that helps make a mission stick out. And it definitely did so for me. You continue to prove the Mongols are not unstoppable. You taught me to fight. I couldn't disappoint you. And you never have. I am proud of the warrior. The man you have become. Jin, my message to the Shogun included an announcement. I wish to formally adopt you as my son. Uncle. In my heart, you have always been the heir to my legacy. And so yeah, the message goes out and some time apparently passes because when you are ready to proceed, everyone is met up at the fort in Toyotama to prepare. Before the attack proceeds, Lord Shimura receives info that Ryuso, the traitor, is stationed with Mongol forces at a fort nearby. Jin decides to finally deal with the traitor, and does so alone when Yuna declines to help him. Well, or he thought he was alone. When Jin arrives at the fort, Taka shows up behind him in a surprise twist. He says that he no longer wants to sit by and let other people fight for him. So Jin reluctantly agrees to let him help. He tells Taka to create a distraction outside the fort to allow Jin to sneak in. And at first, everything seems to go to plan. Taka creates the distraction and rides his horse back towards Shimura's camp, and Jin sneaks in undetected. Except, the entire thing was a ruse. Ryuzo leaked the information on purpose to lure Jin to the fort. You get knocked out and wake up hours later to find yourself and Taka both tied up. Koten Khan is there, offering you a drink of water and playing nice. He pleads with you to just join his side, quit the fighting, allow Tsushima to be conquered, see how peaceful we have been to the people in towns that have surrendered. But of course, Jin would never do that. And so, angered by his refusal, the Khan executes Taka right in front of you, then cuts off his head and shoves it in your face. Stop! Tell you that! It's a brutal, emotionally charged moment that seems to happen far too quickly, with no warning. It was just as much of a shock to me as I'm sure it was for Jin. I mean, I knew it was probably coming, but the deed itself was just so sudden. For a while now, you've been acting to some degree as Taka's caretaker. You fought next to him, under constant fear that should he get hurt, Yuna would blame you. And it finally happened. Jin blacks out and is apparently spared as when he wakes up, Yuna is there asking for her brother. I think here, a lesser game would have used this event to make Yuna blame and hate Jin as a source of making conflict. But instead, while she is completely broken, some part of her realizes that it isn't Jin's fault. Taka would have followed him even if he forbade it, even if Yuna forbade it. Nothing would have stopped him from joining the fight. She knew that, and it speaks to her character that through all of that grief, she doesn't take it out on her friend. They bury Taka and make their way back to Shimura's temporary fort to prepare for the siege, including samurai sent from the Shogun. 
You speak to all of your allies that you gained along the way, and then the mission to retake Castle Shimura begins. This is a pretty long and epic battle, starting with an awesome flyover camera shot, slowly zooming in on your character riding your horse straight at the enemy. It's one of a few different battles where all of your allies that you recruited are fighting side by side with you. That is, again, some really cool game design. It's like you created your own A-team, started your own Avengers initiative, but, you know, with katanas and samurai armor. At the risk of sounding like an IGN journalist, it really feels like you're in an actual battle at points, rather than just a few guys skirmishing outside like in most video games. The Huachas are raining fire arrows down on all of you as you fight your way into the castle. This is where the ludonarrative dissonance that I spoke about way back in the beginning of this long-ass video rears its ugly head. Remember that? The Mongols hold off the attack at a bridge, shooting down any Japanese soldier that tries to cross. Lord Shimura wants to take the bridge and keep by force, because the samurai code dictates that you must always face your enemy head on. Jin, on the other hand, having the experience of acting as the ghost, wants to sneak in and use the poison Yuriko made for him on the Mongol communal drinks. There is a heated argument where Shimura forbids Jin from acting. Like with honor. Honor died on the beach. The Khan deserves to suffer. You, the player, have no choice in the matter. Nothing you did beforehand matters or is canon. Whether you, like me, chose to always face your enemies as an honorable samurai, or if you chose to always attack from the shadows, it doesn't matter. The game forces you to take the path of the ghost and poison the Mongol drinks. I've already spoken about why I don't like this, so I'm just going to move on for now. After sneaking in and poisoning the drinks, you are confronted a final time by Ryuso, who has been going mad after facing off against Jin the first time and then being forced to burn innocent Japanese citizens alive. Jin puts him out of his misery in another very emotionally charged battle. It's a good send-off to the character who I really wanted to see redeemed until the whole burning people alive and getting Taka killed thing. Then, of course, Lord Shimura finds out what Jin did, and needless to say, he is a little pissed. Surrounded by the dead bodies of Mongols, the evidence of your crime, and disobedience of his orders, he tells Jin to blame Yuna, but of course Jin won't do that. And because Shimura's honor is inflexible, he sentences Jin to imprisonment, and likely death. All after he saved a good chunk of the army that would have died on that bridge, but okay. That emotion, the empathy I had for Jin in that moment, was crafted by Sucker Punch. That is something that this game gets consistently right. Anytime Jin felt a strong emotion, the gameplay and cutscenes were so well crafted that I felt those same emotions. This is something that sounds obvious, but is actually a hard thing to pull off, especially in video games. Many games try to make the characters empathetic, but in most cases they just fall flat. This is why games such as The Last of Us and God of War are so memorable because they do succeed in this area. Thus begins Act 3, starting with Kinji breaking you out of prison. You and your horse, mine was named Nobu, get away safely and flee to the north, to Kamiyagata, where Yuna is waiting to meet you. While fleeing, Nobu is shot by a few arrows, and Jin just continues to run him into the ground. Nobu dies before you reach Yuna, which, God... Damn it, Sucker Punch. It was a real dick move to make me pick and name my horse and say he will be with you for your whole journey, only to let him die. I'm not crying. 
So anyways, Jin has to make his way north on foot. When he gets to the town where Yuna is waiting, he finds it already burned to the ground and occupied by Mongols. He almost sneaks past the guards, but takes yet another arrow to the back and passes out. And so, Ghost ends the same way it begins, Jin being shot and Yuna finding and nursing him back to health. You wake up outside Gosaku Temple, which sits near a frozen lake, which is awesome scenery. The temple is, of course, occupied by Mongols, so you and Yuna have to take them out in a fight on the frozen lake and take back the temple. From here, the rest of Act 3 is relatively short. You can finish up all the main character storylines and do the last of the mythic tales. The Snowy Mountain one. Do it. Yuna gets Jin to meet her quote-unquote hunter friends to take out a fort that's blocking the path between Toyotama and Kamiyagata. It seems a bunch of the allies that Jin has recruited throughout his journey heard of his escape from Lord Shimura's camp and are trying to join him up at Jogaku Temple, including Masako, Ishikawa, Norio, the Yarikawans, and others. During your attack on the fort, you meet all of them coming up from the south. After all your allies meet up at the temple, you and Yuna go out on a scouting mission to find the Khan and the rest of the Mongol army and their encampment location. Turns out they are all situated near a temple on the coast, Mongol warships on and near the shore. Not only that, they somehow discovered how to use the poison that Jin used on them and are mass producing it to force Tsushima to either surrender or all die. This is apparently the Khan's evil endgame. Before going into battle, Jin decides to give his uncle a chance to join him in finally killing the Khan. He sneaks back into Castle Shimura to leave a message about their plans to attack the Mongols. It's a rare stealth mission where you can't assassinate anyone. Jin sneaks through the castle as Lord Shimura rallies his men with a speech, and then sneaks into the main keep to get into the Lord's room. Lord Shimura does end up finding the message, but it's left ambiguous as to whether or not he accepts the invitation. Finally, the day comes. Jin and his makeshift army attack the Mongol forces, and Jin makes his way to the Khan. All of your allies keep the Mongol forces busy while you fight, and in a really obvious twist, Lord Shimura does show up to join the battle. You find the Khan outside the temple, ready and apparently waiting for you to appear. He is a very difficult boss fight, especially when playing on hard like I was. It's definitely Dark Souls level at that difficulty, which I've been trying to refrain from using that comparison, but this honestly was. It's also completely unique. None of the other previous bosses you fight used his moveset or weapon type, which was nice to see. Khan telegraphs his moves well, but also moves extremely fast so that it's hard to keep up. But when you finally whittle down his health bar, the game says, Psych! You didn't actually kill him, idiot! He poisons you and then runs away, leaving two of his men to kill you. There is a second phase where the Khan is moved to a docked ship and uses his men to try to kill you, sneaking in occasionally to attack himself. He isn't quite as hard in this phase, however there are a ton of other enemies to deal with. The entire second fight is frantic as all hell. Normally I will hoard my consumables in video games even until the end. Needless to say, I couldn't do that here. This fight forced me to use all of them, and even then it was rough. It was a great final boss fight and send off to the game. But finally you strike the last blow, the Khan is dead, the Mongol invasion is over. Except the game is not completely over. It sends you into an epilogue of sorts. It seems that Lord Shimura wishes to speak with you and asks you to meet him under the red tree in Omi Village that he trained you under as a kid. When you get there, you share a seemingly lighthearted conversation between friendly victors of a war. You get on your horses. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Yuna provided you with another horse that you get to name. Uh, too bad it's still not my Nobu. Anyways, you head towards the cemetery where Jin's family is buried. On the way, a man pulling a cart is stuck in the mud, and both of you help him out. It's a nice touch that shows the new problems the citizens of Tsushima are facing now that the war is over. They are much lower stakes, and it feels good just to help out and not be destructive for once. By the time you arrive at the cemetery, the conversation has taken a different tone. 
Lord Shimura talks about how Ghost's forces are not yet disbanded, and now that they are without an enemy and sitting idly by, they pose a threat to Tsushima and the Shogunate. Jin assures Shimura that this is not the case, that he himself will disband them. However, this is not good enough for the Lord. He questions whether or not they would even listen to an order like this, after witnessing Jin publicly disobey his Jito. It comes out that the Shogun has ordered Shimura to kill Jin, to send a message to Ghost's forces, and to punish him for disobeying his superior back at Castle Shimura. So begins a somber ritual where Jin writes one last haiku, reflecting on his journey, and then must fight Lord Shimura to the death. It's funny, I thought Shimura was trying to make Jin commit Sudoku. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Seppuku. But he actually intended to duel him. It shows how much I know about the samurai code. Basically nothing. Since death here will simply restart the checkpoint, the only possible outcome is Jin winning. When he does, Lord Shimura asks you to kill him, to preserve his honor. You can either respect his wishes, or spare him and call him a slave to honor. Either way, it doesn't really matter in terms of practical consequences. The true epilogue of the game ends the same way, with Jin a fugitive of the Shogunate, meeting at a secret hideout with Yuna. They discuss fighting the remaining Mongol forces on the island, and with that, the game is finally over. Recall that after attacking Castle Kanada and nearly dying again, Jin and Yuna decide that they need to recruit more samurai. As you meet these main characters, you will unlock their stories. These are multi-part quests, none of which can be completed in a single sitting, as they are split up between the different regions of Tsushima and the different acts of the story. The stories function in multiple ways. Most pragmatically, they begin as a way to recruit these people to help save Jin's uncle. However, as each of the characters and their storylines are so interesting, they wind up simply being windows into the characters' lives, which you can't help but want to look through. As you help them with their issues, they also stick around with Jin throughout the story and help him retake Castle Canada, among other major conflicts in the game. As I mentioned before, you actually fight right beside them at times, even having to heal them when they fall. I'm looking at you, Norio. I didn't test what would happen if you simply didn't continue the storylines after the first mandatory ones. There are nine parts for some of them, three or four for others. Whether the characters continue to fight with you or if they stop whenever you stop helping. Though, I don't think that's the case. I don't know. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. So as I said, you play as Jin. Jin is the son of a samurai who passed and is now the lord of House Sakai. He holds guilt about his father's death as he was unable to save him when bandits attacked their village. After this, his uncle, Lord Shimura, took him in. His guilt over his father and his sense of duty and loyalty towards Shimura and the samurai code that was instilled in him are the main driving forces in Jin's character. At first, Jin seems like the least interesting character in the game, which is actually pretty normal for an RPG. However, by the end, the game adds enough nuance to his character that he feels less like a self-insert than he does an actual person. I would still say that Jin is often overly stoic, which does make him less interesting than some of the other main characters. The only reason Jin did survive is because of a woman named Yuna, who nursed him back to health after he got shot by, like, a bunch of arrows. It actually strains credulity that Jin survives some of what he does, but that's besides the point. Yuna is a thief, and she helps Jin by teaching him her ways. As I said previously, this is the part of the game where you begin to learn assassination techniques and craft ghost weapons. Yuna herself is sincere when she needs to be, but completely unafraid of Jin, and can even be a smartass to him at times though he outranks her in their society by a country mile, and every other person of her rank in the game treat him like the lord he is. She will fight with Jin to get back his uncle right after meeting him, because he promised to help her save her brother. While that might not seem like much without context for a video game, they are fighting what could potentially be the entire Mongol army, and the Khan himself, as they are attacking Castle Kanada. Just two people. This shows the bravery of Yuna, but more importantly, how loyal she is to those she loves. These aspects are further explored in her questline. The order of the next few characters you meet will be up to you, so I'll just go with how it went for me. I found Lord Ishikawa as a broken man who had just lost his only pupil, 
Tomoe, someone so talented and close to him that he considered her a daughter and was intending to pass his legacy on to her. It is a tale that lasts for nine chapters and spans the entire island of Tsushima. He tells Jin that they were both attacked by raiders, and you come to find out that, in fact, she had been captured by Mongols. This sad but ultimately hopeful tale takes a turn when you go to rescue her and find evidence that she's actually been training the Mongols in the way of the bow, which is Sensei Ishikawa's sacred teachings. In a lesser game, you would be tasked immediately with hunting her down and stopping her from teaching anyone else, and do so. Actually, that is what the game ostensibly wants you to do at first. You find camps and towns where Japanese civilians have been slaughtered, and people claim that Tomoe was leading the people responsible. Everything is pointing to her being some kind of vicious monster. At the same time you're learning all of this, you're also writing with and speaking to Ishikawa. Slowly, you piece together the type of relationship that the master and student had, that he was harsh beyond what was appropriate. You find that out firsthand when the sensei knowingly sends you into a Mongol trap to observe how you perform. Eventually, it comes out that the sensei had tried to kill Tomoe once before. She had taught a band of assassins, like she was doing now with the Mongols, and so he knew what she was capable of, that she had a thirst for blood. Basically, with each passing mission, the failings of the sensei, and indeed his humanity and just wanting a daughter to pass on his teachings to, come more clearly into focus. I really felt for Ishikawa in this story. He's just a broken man, wanting desperately to do the right thing, but always coming into conflict with himself. He is this self-defeating master of the bow, and the fact that he has accomplished as much as he has with those issues is frankly remarkable. The fact that Sucker Punch was able to impart that emotion onto me was even more so. I'll leave the ending for you to discover, but I will say that by the end, even Tomoe becomes a much more complex character, and your hunt for her becomes fraught. There is a point where, upon looking for Ishikawa, you happen upon a woman picking up traps out in the frozen forest. You help her and chat with her amiably, but eventually it's revealed that this is, in fact, Tomoe. Jin had never seen her face previous to this, but was able to deduce it was her through her questions. This was a really cool break in the storytelling that had, until that point, basically been portraying her as this monster. Next, we meet Masako. If Sensei Ishikawa was broken, then Masako is shattered. Her entire family was slaughtered, not by Mongols, but by an unknown group of Japanese bandits for reasons unknown. She was the wife of one of the lords of Tsushima, who also died at Kanada Beach in the Mongol attack. We find her burying her grandchildren in a cemetery, and Jin has the absolute gall to ask her for help. She actually agrees, but only if we help her hunt down her family's murderers. This is another tale that spans the whole game in Island, and it has just as much pathos as Ishikawa's tale. Masako has lost absolutely everything in the worst way possible, and it is clear that she is not taking it well. She abruptly slaughters the very first lead you get in the investigation to who killed her family, a monk from the local temple, when he reveals he was involved. The camera focuses on her blood-spattered face and empty eyes, and you can't help but feel some part of her pain. The entire journey sees Masako sink deeper and deeper into this cycle of violence and revenge, until by the end she is threatening innocent monks without even hearing them out. In one mission, you help her to find one of her old house servants. Masako believes that she stole some stuff from the house and wants to find out if there's any connection between that and her family's killers. However, by the end of the mission, it comes out that Masako and this female servant had a tryst. It's only a brief mention, but it's nice to see some inclusivity on the part of Sucker Punch, especially within the context of the game, which is feudal Japanese society which, like many other countries, has a complex relationship with homosexuality. However, since the invasion that this game centers around happened around 1274, this is before a lot of the homosexual bans in Japan went into effect, and there were actually some ancient writings that talk about best practices and things like that, so it seems that it was a little bit more accepted then. Just as a side note, I recommend anybody just Google homosexuality in Japan and look at the wiki page, which is enormous, and go down the entire rabbit hole that I went down just to feel at least somewhat confident in speaking the last few sentences. 
Back to Yuna. Her quest line involves saving her brother, Taka, a blacksmith. Both of them had a hard life growing up on the streets, with the older sister taking care of the two. She just wants to find him and escape to the mainland to live their lives in peace. Taka has been captured by the Mongols and is being held in a heavily occupied town in the south. Part of the reason Jin agrees to rescue him is that Yuna promises that Taka will craft a tool that will allow him to scale the cliffs outside Castle Kaneda. So, after taking out an entire town's worth of Mongols and defending a forge while Taka works on a grappling hook, you can finally rescue your uncle. As the story progresses, Taka becomes more and more determined to fight for himself, seeing Jin as an example. Except, he doesn't have the combat experience that Jin does. There are multiple close calls, and at one point you fight right next to Taka, but will most likely get separated in the fray. I had this moment of genuine panic when at the end of the fight I couldn't find Taka, and that is the best indicator of the quality of writing. I know I've said this multiple times, but it is truly astounding that with all these characters, Sucker Punch actually gets you to care about, if not all, most of them. Even most AAA games cannot accomplish that with a single character, let alone a large cast. Yuna's story ends with a quest line where you help save her friends in from the Mongols. To do so, you must first draw the leader out by taking out his allies. One such ally, or allies, are a group of brothers that, well, let's just say that Vlad of Transylvania would be proud. Their camp is surrounded by burnt, impaled corpses like some kind of fucked up tree grove. While the sight is disturbing, Yuna is affected more by the brother's presence nearby. Apparently, Yuna and her brother were taken captive as slaves by these brothers and barely escaped with their lives, which is no small feat considering said human tree grove. This entire game, Yuna has been a reliable, courageous ally. She has never shown any cowardice or hesitation, even when storming a fucking castle filled to the brim with Mongols. Twice! Yet here, she can't continue. Jin must complete this part of the mission by himself. Her trauma and fear paralyze her, and this contrast really shines. Yuna is no Mary Sue. She is a strong character that has some real, clear, human flaws. The last character you meet in Act 1 is Ryuso. He is the leader of the Straw Hat Ronin, a mercenary group that Jin wants to recruit to their fight. You find him in a forest and are immediately ambushed by the Mongols and have to team up to fight them off. As with the others, Ryuzo needs help with something before he will help Jin. In his case though, his men are starving. They haven't been able to eat in some time. Through everything else, there is some tension behind the words that you share with Ryuzo, though it's not immediately clear why. As his story progresses, it comes out that there was a tournament in the past where prospective samurai dueled for the Jito's favor. Jin and Ryuzo dueled and Jin won, which prevented Ryuzo from becoming a samurai. So Ryuzo is a little bit bitter, especially since it clearly never even occurred to Jin that his win was an issue. Regardless, it seems that everything is okay because you continue to fight alongside him and take back multiple Mongol installations to find food. Unfortunately, for each place you go to, including a fort, a lighthouse, and a group of ships in the bay, among others, there is no food to be found. Each time, Jin promises Ryuzo that they will find it soon, and to be fair, they usually find some sort of lead on where the food might be. However, leads don't feed his men. They are still starving, and so far you've come back empty-handed. Finally, Ryuzo tells you that some of his men were captured at a Mongol fort, and that he needs help rescuing them. So you do, and everything goes according to plan. You wipe out the Mongols and save every single one of his men, though again, no food. Still, Ryuzo is grateful to Jin for helping. He is also perplexed as the Mongols didn't harm a single one of his men, and he can't comprehend why not. This is textbook storytelling, a perfect, subtle setup for what comes next, and easily missable if you're not paying attention. See, when you finally storm Castle Kaneda, each one of the characters that you have helped thus far meets you there, each character except Ryuzo. He is markedly absent. Then, when you get into the inner castle walls, there he is, a traitor that sided with the Mongol invaders. This was just excellent, brilliantly done. Having spent so much time as allies and empathizing with Ryuzo's situation, I felt just as torn as Jin did in this scene. You have to fight him, 
but neither Jin nor I really wanted to because Sucker Punch made me care. You spare Ryuzo's life, and he runs. This isn't the last time you see him, though, as we saw in the story section. Throughout the rest of the story, he becomes the right hand of the Khan and slowly devolves even further to the other side. And each step in that direction is painful. The next character you meet is in Act 2, Norio. He is a warrior monk, and you help him to take back a couple temples, avenging his brother who was the guardian of the temples before he was killed by Mongols. To be honest, I didn't connect with Norio in the same way that I did with the other characters, so I don't have as much to say about him. I've thought about it for a while, and I'm still not sure why I didn't connect. I think he was just too pliable, too easily angered. And I get that's what it's supposed to make his character interesting, that he's subverting the stereotype of the stoic monk, but it honestly just comes off as annoying. And at the end of the day, his character is just not as strong or interesting as someone like Masako, or Yuna, or Ryuso. Towards the end of the storyline, it's revealed that Norio's brother wasn't actually dead. No. The Mongols just, you know, cut off his arms and legs and let him sit in a temple like he was in Mani fucking Python until he gave up information on the temples. As one does. <laughs> Conveniently, he survives until just after Norio finds him, just long enough to say goodbye. And yeah, that's basically all I have to say for Norio. There, there are two other characters who have their own smaller storylines, which I'll briefly touch on. Kinji is the guy that helped you and Yuna sneak into the Mongol-controlled town to save Taka. He is a smuggler with questionable ethics and is basically the only comic relief in the entire game. While he is a breath of fresh air in that regard, his quest lines mostly amount to Jin saving him from whatever hijinks he found himself in. It's fun, but there's not much more to him or his quests, and so I don't have much more to say. Yuriko is an even smaller character, yet her story is vastly more interesting and well-written. She is the caretaker of the Sakai clan home and took care of Jin as a child. So the two already have this rich history together that the writing can lean on, as opposed to basically all the other storyline characters that you meet in the present. Her story begins in Toyotama, when Jin visits his family home to recover the clan Sakai armor. Yuriko's storyline is basically an excuse to reminisce with Jin and craft for him poison and hallucinogenic darts. However, things take an interesting turn when, in the first mission, she takes you to the incorrect cemetery to make sure no bandits have looted the tombs. This misstep is quickly explained away by the lady as just so many years passing since she visited the place. Unlike the game, which only briefly and subtly depicts Yuriko's mistake, I am going to ask you to remember this for a second. In the next quest, you both stop at a lake for her to rest for a bit after riding slowly behind her. At this point, both myself and Jen were getting a little annoyed and impatient with Yuriko. I even had a little blurb written in my notes that this quest just seemed to be a time waster, or that Sucker Punch were just trying to pad out the game's runtime. How wrong I was. I was dragged right back in when Yuriko apologizes and explains that she was actually doing it on purpose, just to spend a little bit more time with Jin before he rushes off again. In her final quest, it's revealed both that Yuriko is actually suffering from dementia, thus explaining the mistake with the cemetery, and that she likely had an affair, or at least wanted to, with Jin's father. She mistakes him as his father, and wants to bathe together in a hot spring, to, uh, you know, increase their health bars? I kid, but in all honesty, this revelation sort of comes abruptly, if you missed the warning signs before. This woman who spent her entire life taking care of the Sakai family, Jin in particular, is no longer attached to this reality. Just as Jin is coming to terms with this, trying to find something for Yuriko to eat, to hopefully make her feel better, she disappears. You find her looking out over the ocean, and in a truly heartbreaking cutscene, she dies sitting next to Jin, still believing that he is his father, her love. It's dark, Kasumasa. Tell me what you see. I can see all the way to Yariko. I remember the war. A tragedy for all the clans. Good people remain there. Castle Kaneda. I wish you weren't there so often. Why do you say that? You have many responsibilities. 
I am grateful for the time we share. But I always want more. There's the temple in Kushi. You can see the pagoda. Every new year, I pray there for you and little Jin and my family. Jin is lucky you take such good care of him. Now tell me what you see. I'm not crying. You're crying. This is absolutely a masterclass in good side quest storytelling. Finally, the last two main characters are Koten Khan and Jin's uncle Shimura. Neither one has any side content attached to them, as they are both featured heavily in the main story, so I will just focus on their characters for now. The Khan's first appearance is when a samurai approaches the Mongol army, looking to challenge their leader. Koten just comes out, throws some alcohol on him, and then lights him on fire with a torch, then cuts his head off for good measure. So this is a clear and early message that the main antagonist is willing to do basically anything to win, and is not held back by any code of honor. As the game progresses, Sucker Punch tries to make him more relatable, perhaps more sympathetic, but neither is really achieved. We never really learn much about the Khan, other than he is Genghis's cousin or something, and that he and his generals learn Japanese to prepare for the invasion. He spares towns that submit to his armies, but doesn't hesitate to burn those that defy him. He's basically just a brutal guy that has a few moments where he pretends to be reasonable, but it's all just a ploy, and there really isn't much more to him than that. However, that's okay, because Koten isn't truly the main antagonist of Ghost. That is actually Lord Shimura. The entire first act of the game is Jin trying to rescue his uncle. When he finally succeeds, Shimura immediately sets to retaking his own castle in the north. Along the way, Shimura tells Jin that he intends to adopt him as a son, which is a rather large deal in that society. It means Jin becomes heir to House Shimura and the heir to the Jito. However, Shimura is unbending to his honor, a slave to it, in fact. He told Jin as a child that to strike from the shadows is the way of the coward and goes against the samurai code. He doesn't budge, even to save his men from certain death. This is the big conflict of the game. Jin is willing to do what it takes to win and save lives. Shimura is not. Ultimately, the two conflicting ideologies must meet. I empathized with Shimura, even if I didn't quite agree with everything he said. I had spent so much of my gameplay time trying to be the good samurai that I couldn't help but be annoyed with Jin when he so blithely went against his uncle's wishes. His uncle, who took him in when he had nothing. His uncle, who only wants what's best for Jin, and to give him everything. He and Jin are truly tragic characters. The final thing I'll talk about is the new Legends mode. This is a cooperative game mode that is available to the player at any time, not connected to the progression of the main game, except through a few cosmetics. It was released a few months after the launch of the game, and is a really beefy extension, especially considering it's entirely free once you buy the base game. This will be one of the shorter sections of the video, as I didn't spend too much time with it, just enough to get a good feel of the game mode so I could talk about it here. I highly recommend experiencing it for yourself, because there is a whole lot to it that I probably won't get to. Gamers that played the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer mode a lot will know exactly what I mean. Except, in this case, there are no microtransactions. Thank God. Anyways, while the main game briefly flirts with the supernatural, Legends mode completely embraces it. A nondescript man sitting, somehow, at multiple places throughout the island begins to weave a story to you. It seems that, at the same time the Mongols are invading, there are supernatural forces trying to take over Tsushima in the shadows, and it's up to the player to stop them. In this mode, you are not Jin any longer. You fight as one of four different classes. The Samurai, the Assassin, the Hunter, or the Ronin. Each class is basically just a different aspect of Jin's whole combat arsenal. The Samurai is melee focused. The Hunter is a ranged bowman. The Assassin is an assassin, and the ronin is a support character slash healer. Though they each have their own focuses, each one still has other means of fighting. For example, the samurai still has a bow, and the hunter still has a katana. 
Each character has their own special abilities and their own super, the majority of which are just three enemy insta-kills, but they all have some good visual flair. The samurai's other special ability, for example, is a life drain blade that heals you while you do damage for a short time. There are two game modes in Legends, a campaign slash story mode and a horde mode. The story mode is two player with an asterisk, while the horde mode is a four player. There are nine total missions in the story mode, plus a three part raid that uses four players. Got all that. <laughs> Each mission is unique and tells an actual story, which was quite a nice surprise to me. I was expecting something akin to Nazi Zombies or the aforementioned Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. But no, there is actually a full overarching narrative with each mission feeding into the next. The Horde mode is just how it sounds. Four players fight off waves of enemies, not much more to it than that. Other than some of the mechanics have you defend an area for a short time, etc. In addition to all this, there are multiple difficulty levels for both story and horde modes available that will give you increasingly better rewards. Ah, yes, the rewards. You will get rewards for both leveling up and for completing missions. These can include new ghost weapons, you can equip two at a time, new armor, new swords, etc. In this game mode, rather than having the different stances to adapt to a different enemy type, your sword will have an intrinsic quality that makes it more effective against one specific enemy type. So this one mechanic by itself makes having teammates a necessity, because without multiple sword types in your party, staggering enemies would be an enormous pain. Granted, I didn't get too far in the game mode, so it's possible that the higher tier gear works well against multiple types of enemy. Let me know in the comments. You also gain new cosmetics that let you customize the look of your character. These include armor types and dyes, sword kits, bow colors, helmets, masks, etc. Basically everything available in the main game and more. Finally, the last type of reward is experience. You gain a thousand yard stare from all the battles. Never ending. No, but really, there is a skill tree that gives you different combos and perks, most of which were adapted from the main campaign. Again, all of this stuff is rewarded just for playing the game mode. The free game mode, I'll point out again. And none of it is earned through microtransactions. That single fact makes this game a huge breath of fresh air for multiplayer co-op gameplay. Honestly, Legends mode could be its own separate game given its length and depth. Most devs would have made it that way, slapping on a $30 price tag plus a ton of $10 cosmetic microtransactions. Anyway, that's basically everything I have to say about the Legends mode. It's a lot of fun, and at the very least, it's a great change of pace from the main campaign. Though, why you'd need one from such an astounding game is sort of beyond me. Okay, that was a lot. I remember thinking naively that this script would be 10 to 11 pages. Now I'm staring down the barrel at page number 31, wondering what the fuck I'm doing with my life. Ghosts of Tsushima is a true masterpiece. From its flawless performance, its immaculate polish, incredible storytelling and world building, and extremely satisfying combat, plus what's basically an entire free second game for good measure. It's really tough to find anything to truly dislike about the game. But yeah, that's why I placed all my complaints at the beginning to serve as contrast to the absolute ocean of compliments I had for the game. Just like Breath of the Wild before it, I believe that people will be talking about Ghost as the new bar for open world game design. I know I will be. I really hope that other game developers take to heart the design choices used in this game, that they take those ideas and run with them in their own projects. The naive optimist in me wants to believe that those other devs will see this as a challenge issued and make their own games even better. However, the realist in me has already played Cyberpunk. Sucker Punch, you have put on a masterclass in game design, and all I can do is stand in awe at your accomplishment. Well, that and fire up a new game plus. Oh, or I could do the Legends Raid. So I just wanted to say before I go, this video has been a long time in the making. Just this script has taken me nearly a month, which is part of the reason why this video is so late, and it definitely has nothing to do with the fact that I started the game in January. I have left links to my Patreon in the description and a pinned comment. If you'd like to help support more videos like these, I plan to make more of this type of thing on a regular basis. 
though as I stated, I'm only going to be spending this much time on games that I truly enjoy. I have a bunch of great benefits on my Patreon, from getting your name shown at the end of a video, to me answering your questions, to a super special shout out, to audio only versions of the videos for people wanting to save their precious data plans, and more. Either way, whether you donate or not, I appreciate you watching this monstrosity of a video, and I hope you enjoyed what you saw. Until next time.